few weeks ago, about two weeks ago, we had a Kesha. And the Lord really moved in a special way during the Kesha. And I just want to do some few highlights which is going to lead us into, want, into what I want to share this morning. And uh, part of the highlights, especially for those ones who may not have made it for that Kesha on 10th, we really had an awesome time in the presence of the Lord. And the speaker who took us through the word presented a description of the gates and what happened at the gates. She shared with us a lot of things and gave some personal incidents of a dream of what happens at the gate. And as I was thinking about this, I tried to find out exactly what is the definition of a spiritual gates. And uh, from what I've gathered, I'm being reminded, or we are being reminded that spiritual gates are entry points to known places or to unknown places or to places of importance. The importance part of it depends on individual person. There's somebody who is going to open the gates or will be seated at the gates where the enemy is, triumph is, is, is winning. Another person will be seated at the gates where righteousness it all depends on where you are positioning yourself as a believer. Somebody else also said the gates, the spiritual gates are thresholds that connects the living and the dead. It is also a place of contest. Uh, the contest between the power of evil and the power of righteousness. And as we are thinking about the gates, I'm asking ourselves this morning, and I'm asking myself, what is your stand? Have you taken a stand on which particular part of your gate? And that brings us on the topic or on the word, taking a stand at the gate. And so, uh, during the Bible, in the Bible times, uh, the city gates were not just the entry into the gate or into the city. But the Bible described that they were places where a prophet would make prophecy, would cry out, and the kings would make ruling or judgment on behalf of the common man. And uh, the other highlight that we picked during this Kesha was the very powerful question. The question is, who is seated at the gate of Kenya? Who is making the rules? Who is making the decree of whatever is happening in the nation of Kenya? Who is making decision? Is it the president or some forces behind the leadership of the nation? And so when we see policies being developed, and part of the policies, I've had a few young people raise alarm. I, with these new taxes on issues of marriage and getting a certificate, tutatobua kweli. See, we are being encouraged to just come, we stay. To a channel history is a story. And I've had people raise up concerns. But before we raise alarm and we start talking and criticizing what is happening, let's come back to ourselves and ask ourselves real important questions. Who is making decisions in the land? Buanesu Asifiwe. When we hear the issue of LB, LGBTQ passed on and a few members in the church are raising alarm and is like what exactly is happening? The question that we should go back and ask ourselves, who is seated at the gates of Kenya? Who is making decisions? 
Our speaker also reminded us of spiritual wars about our destiny. It's at the gate where some decisions are made about your life. And I, I remember we were being told that the hours between midnight and three are very crucial hours. There are hours where the enemy's camp are sitting down and plotting what are they, are they going to do concerning so and so to make sure that this person does not progress. And we are being challenged to arise and wake up and find our place on our knees contesting about our destiny. And there is a lot that was shared. I don't want to dwell so much on what happened on Friday. But it's very important. It is an issue that we need to ask ourselves. Have we, are we being sensitized to keep alert to know what is our position at the gates? And thinking about the gates, there are 12 gates that the Bible talk about. If you find time, you could read uh, Revelations 21 uh, from verse 9 up to verse 12. But I would want to summarize it from verse 12. In verse 12, um, yeah, 12 to 14, the Bible says that, yeah, also she had a great and high wall with the 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them, which were the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Next, 13. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. 14. Now the walls of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And, and he who talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city gate, its gates, and its walls. You can hold it there. And I'm interested to know some of the names that were named after those gates. Each gate had a specific name, and each gate had a purpose. One of the gates you read in the Bible is called the beautiful gate. It's found in Acts chapter number 3, verses 2. And the Bible talks about now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. It's a story that you know so well. And this person later on is complaining that every time the angel would stir the water, by the time he wants to jump in, somebody has jumped in, and he's left there because there was nobody to pick him there. And I don't want us to dwell on that, but the truth is, there is a place called the beautiful gate, meaning there is something positive about the gates. If you take a stand at the rightful place, we can call that place beautiful gate. It can be beautiful for you as somebody who is alert in the spirit, beautiful for you, for somebody who is called an altar warrior. Beautiful for you, for somebody who is called a prayer warrior. Psalms, chapter number 11, verses 20, uh, one, uh, 118, verses 20. The Bible talks about the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous, the righteous may enter. Th this is the gate of the Lord through which the, righ the righteous shall enter. Meaning, when we're talking about the heavenly places, God desires us to enter through the rightful gate. And the righteous gate is also described in, uh, in New Testament, where Jesus says, I am the door. No one goes to the Father except through me. When we find the importance of knowing the King of Kings and having a real awesome relationship between Jesus and us and you, then you'll be able to understand why he is calling us, why this gate is called the righteous gate. It's only those people whose life have been garnished, washed, blood-washed people are finding joy to enter 
into that gate. And the question is, have you entered through that, the rightful gate? In the interest of time, I want us to look into a, uh, an issue about the gatekeeper. And I want to focus specifically on the person that we call the gatekeeper. Who is the gatekeeper? Somebody by the name Carl Lewin described a spiritual gatekeeper as a person who controls access to something. For example, one who stands on the city gate or at the heaven's gate. You may meet with a, a heavenly gate bouncer. We, we can also call him a bouncer in the heavenly gate. When you're talking about bonsai, the young people who are in the house understands. You go to Florida too and you try to enter without paying. Then you'll discover who is a bouncer. You'll be lifted unyo unyo without your knowledge. You'll be thrown out within a short time. Because those people, they mean business. And how nice it is when we discover that in the body of Christ, we have bouncers in the spirit. And so... The role of a gatekeeper, there are several roles that a gatekeeper is expected to do. And if you pick it from the book of First Chronicles, chapter number 9, verses 23, the Bible says their duty was to guard the gates of the house of Yahweh. Guard the gate. So they and their children were in, the, in charge of the gates of the house of the Lord, the house of the tabernacle. By assignment. And I want us to pick it from there. We have an assignment. We may not have known that the Lord desires us to be a serious gatekeeper. And we'll discover as we continue how to be a gatekeeper in the spiritual realm. Again, one other, another assignment was to close, closing and opening them at the proper time. In other words, there is a time of, and season where gates have to be closed and there is some season where gates have to be opened. You pick it up from Chronicles 9 verses 27. They would spend the night stationed around the house of God because they had to guard it and they had, they had charge over the key for opening it each morning. Every morning. In other words, there is a season and, and that's why as a believer there is need for us to realize the importance of early morning devotion. A time just to pour your heart to God. It's at that particular time you are interacting with the heavenly bouncers and you are interacting with the, with the, the spirit of God and the Lord opens your door to see what is taking place today. At the watch hours of the morning, what does God expect of me? Where does God want me to be? What does God want me to accomplish? Those are the moments you reason in the process of opening up the presence of God into your life, into your circumstances, into your situation. The other thing uh, as a gatekeeper's role is preventing the unclean from entering the sacred closure. Preventing the, un the unclean from entering the sacred closure. And that's when we find in Second Chronicles chapter number uh, 23, verses 19. He also stationed, uh, he also stationed gatekeepers at the gate of the Lord's temple so that no one was in the way unclean might enter. There is a season that the Spirit is speaking to the church. There's a season when so much is happening in the body of Christ. Somebody says that the church is becoming worldly and the world is becoming church. It's an aspect of religiousness. Now, when the, world, when the church becoming worldly, it means sin is filtrating into the body of Christ. The fear of the Lord is kind of waxing away. There are things that in the recent past we've been hearing happening in the body of Christ 
you are left tongue-tied. You are not so sure whether you are still in the Pentecostal church. And God is concerned about these things. And he's asking, where are the gatekeepers who are watching over issues of righteousness? The moment people come in and you hear somebody sneaked in and stole this and took a phone, it's just because the fear of the Lord is waxing away. But that's the time when gatekeepers who are in the spirit will take their stand and say, mm -mm, enough is enough. Something has to tow the line. And that's what we need, gatekeepers in the body of Christ. In 2 Chronicles chapter number 31, verses 14, the other kind of a role is that they had a charge of a sacred vessels and of the free will offering. Sacred vessel. Sacred vessel were those things which were used for burning incense and kadalika. Let's speak it from verse 14. Korah, the son of Emma, the Levite, the keeper of the eastern gate, was over the free will offering to God to distribute the offering of the Lord and the most holy things. To do what? To distribute the offering of the Lord and the most holy things. There are things that are in the body of Christ which are supposed to be termed holy. There are things in the body of Christ which are supposed to be termed holy. Anything that has been put aside, consecrated for the use of God, God puts it as a holy vessel. But above all, forget about the physical things. One of the greatest vessels that God is looking for is your heart. When your heart is holy, you become a very useful instrument in the hands of God. That is the time when the enemy cannot play around in the presence of people of God because the anointing flows and every evil spirit and some characters cannot stand for so long because God has taken church. I want us to bring it closer to us. Those were roles, as by the way. But what is your role as a gatekeeper? You who is seated here, who is listening to, the, to my voice this morning, what is your role as a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord? The church that prays and is motivated by a life of holiness holds a balance of power in the world affairs. It holds the balance of power. It has the voice to say, mm -mm, this one cannot continue. And things are happening. When the taxes are going high and the fuel levy is going high, this is the time when God is looking for gatekeepers who are saying, hey, something has to change in the policies of the government. There are taxes we don't deny we have to pay. But there are some things that are being over stressed on Mwanainchi. How do we stop it if the church is silent? The Lord is looking for gatekeepers. Bwana The praying church is actually deciding the cause of human rights. The praying church, ask yourself, are you one of the, ask your neighbor, are you one of the praying member of the church? Are you one who is a, a gatekeeper? Are you one who is at the altar and you are commanding things to happen? Are you one of them? It has been said that history belongs to intercessors. Intercessors who have waited on the Lord have a history and they have testimony after testimony. The other day we were listening to the, the topic of our late father, Joe Kyle, the founder of this, the deliverance ministry. And as I was flowing, I would hear him share testimonies of the deep relationship that he had with God. The relationship was so tight until God will speak to him instantly in many ways. And I told God, God, if there is anything before I went, uh, I go under six by six, I want to have such a relationship where I would hear your voice at all times showing me direction of how things should happen around my life. The 
the the other question that I was asking is this. Oh, there, there's a quote that uh, a man of God called Paul Bill Mayer says. He says, it is clear God moves in the cause of the affairs of humankind when his people pray. And I want you to mark that word. When his people pray, God moves. In other words, my emphasis this morning is pray, 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 and after you've prayed, pray again. We've not prayed enough. Because if you have prayed enough, there are things that will be taking shape in this place and sin can never be tolerated in any way. Who are today's gatekeeper? Who, are, who is it that is a gatekeeper today? I want to describe a few points on who are gatekeepers. Number one, they are prayer warriors. They keep watching prayer in and out of season. There are those people, whether it is raining, you'll find them praying on Monday. You'll find them in, on Wednesday, standing on the gap. You'll find them, them taking a part in prayer and fasting when season has come for prayer and fasting. In season and out of season, whether it is 40 days or it is not 40 days, you'll find them have a schedule of prayer. And those are the gatekeepers that God is looking for. A story is told about an evangelist, prayer warrior, who went witnessing in one of the cities in Russia. And in that city, he, 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 he focused on going to the villages. He, he avoided going so much on the, on the town, on the cities, on the suburb. Because there are so many churches that could preach the gospel. But there are some places which the gospel had not filtrated. Had, people have never heard the gospel. So him and his team decided to look for trucks to go from one village to another. So they went to this first village after spending some quality time of prayer. And as they approached the entrance point of that city, they noticed that people who are so, it's like they've been waiting for them. What is this that you have? And giving the trucks was not a big issue. It was an evangelistic kind of truck. Chukuai. And it's like they would want to be with them. They would want to ask questions. Tell us more about your God. And it was so exciting. And as an, an evangelist who has ever tried going out from door to door, you will tell the difference when people are receptive to you and when people close door on you even before you say a word. Munataka? Mimi yostari ishieni? It happens. But in this case, these people were so receptive until they, they were so excited. So they shared and so many souls came to the Lord. And then after that, he went to another village. And as they entered that village, they noticed the difference. The difference was everybody had put a wall over them. It's like they go... They want to give a truck and he's like, mm -mm, not me. They go to another place, not me. They go to another door to knock, say, what do you want? Not me. And uh, they took a pause and they, they re retreated back and had to take some hours in prayer, waiting and breaking some stronghold. And the Bible talks about 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image of God, should shine on them. We are talking about minds that the God of this age has blinded. When the enemy blinds the believer's eyes, they cannot perceive the things of the spirit. Their spirit is dead. Praying becomes a tall order. Love for godly things becomes a burden. Waiting on God becomes just impossible. Those are the times when their mind has been clogged by something evil that is causing them not to see God and to see the way God wants to do his things. But when they prayed and then they started binding 
and releasing, uh, removing the blindness in the eyes of these particular people in this village, they took another step to go and try it again. And within a short time when they went, everybody's like, they are, the people that now they visited, of that everybody was receptive. Everybody wanted to hear the gospel. And at the end of the day, so many people received the Lord in the second village. Psalms chapter number 2 verses 8 is, is relying, cry. It's, it's, it's saying, oh, sorry, I can't see it from there. Yeah. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Ask of me. The Lord is talking about us asking him. Ask of me and I will give you the nations. There is particular part of the nation that has not been reached with the gospel. Yesterday we attended a meeting and we had this missionary pastor who is so passionate for mission on those areas like uh, Kakumar, those interior places whereby the roads are so rough, even getting there is a stress. And as he was sharing, I saw the, the need that there is so much that we do here and outside there, there is somebody who has not heard the gospel. And the, the Lord is asking us, ask of the nation and the ends of the earth for your purpose. There is that part of the end of the earth for possessing souls that are supposed to be won into the kingdom. Remember, the moment this gospel is not spread beyond what we can reach, that's the reason why it is taking long for Christ to come. The promise was this gospel will be preached to the ends of the world and after it has, been, it has reached humanity, that is when Christ will find the joy of coming. The question I would want to ask is this, and I'm asking myself too, would I like to submit, I would like to submit to us that uh, we are in a holy war, all right? We are in a holy war for souls of men and women that are perishing now and again. Every time an accident has taken place, the question that we should ask in that bus, how many souls were born again and how many souls miss it to heaven? We are wrestling in a heavenly places against an enemy who is ruthless. And his mission, as it has always been said in John 10.10, 10, is to steal, kill, and destroy. And the question is, when he's so passionate, he doesn't sleep, day and night he's scheming on how to win some other souls into his side. What are we doing to counterattack him if we don't stand strong in these gates I'm talking about? This enemy is a master strategist who wants to pervert God's design or he wants to pervert the purposes uh, of God for the nation. He wants to undermine the rule of the kingdom of light and establish the throne and dominion of evil. And that is Satan. And one of his greatest weapons that he's been using in the body of Christ is passivity. And what is passivity? Seeing people who are neither hot or cold. Or the kind of believers who are ni sawa tu. Nani utenda kwa maombi leo? Ah, sijiski, niko sawa. I prayed on Monday. That is enough for the remaining part of the week. Passivity. A very dangerous weapon that the enemy is using against the body of Christ. I want to ask a few questions. One of them is, are you and your team prepared? When I'm talking about a team, I'm talking about a man who has a family. You as a family, are you prepared to take the gates? You and the department that you are in, in this church, are you ready to take your part? Are you walking in forgiveness? And do you have a clean heart? One of the greatest weapons that God has in his hand is when he's interacting with believers who carry a clean heart. No wonder David cried in, in Psalms 51, create in me, O oh Lord, a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. God, David knew the secret of 
what it means to have a clean heart. You can be able to do so much into the kingdom when your life is upright with the Lord. And that is the kind of a gatekeeper God is looking for. The other question is, have you done spiritual mapping? Consider the scope of the battle. Have you, are you underestimating the enemy's trick? Or are you taking for granted some of the things that are happening around your life? Have you done spiritual mapping to know this area, there is something, there is a stronghold. Why is it when these things happen after some time, people are so hot, then after some time people go down? What is happening? God is calling us to do spiritual mapping at the gate and call. Do you need additional intercessors? Do you need more fasting? That is a question that you can only answer you and yourself. I would want us to pray this morning. As I conclude, I want us to take a few minutes and just pray. One thing that I want us to pray is that God will put in our hearts a burden, a desire to be gatekeepers. A hard desire to be gatekeepers. So that we'll be able to rise up in a military intercession to deal with a strong man over our areas, over our nation. Strong man that is suppressing the village. There is a village that nobody wants to get saved. The spirit of alcoholism has taken control. Those are the places that the Lord wants us to wrestle to deliver people who are held captive. If only we'll be able to see the need of being gatekeepers, we will see, we will find the solution to, to bring change in every place we go. We need change in the body of Christ here. We need change. Behind the reason why fuel price has gone high, there is something that can be worked on in prayer to the debates that are going on in the parliament and in, in, in the courts can never work. There is a system that has taken over. But when you pray and we see the seriousness, that is the, when you start seeing the prices going down, it is a team that has risen up in prayer and they are up in arms. They are saying, mm -mm, righteousness must prevail. The Bible says in... Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter number 10, verses 3 to 4. The Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Mm -hmm. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down what? For pulling down what? Strongholds. And so there is a stronghold that is causing frustration in Kenya today. Are we going to sit back and relax? Arise. Arise. And I want us to rise up right now and we call on the name of the Lord. I want us to take a minute. Let's pray that the church will respond, uh, will, will, will repossess the control of the land of Kenya. The church, the body of Christ, the saints will repossess Whatever is controlling will be under their arm. Whatever they say as a believer, because the Bible says whatever we shall agree on earth here is agreeable in heaven. Of course, with the right heart and with the right heart attitude. Take that minute and just before the Lord, let us respond to that, one, to that word this morning. Father, we call on your name this day. We are calling on you. We are saying without you we are not able. As a body of Christ, we could have slumbered. We could have slept. But how I pray that, Lord, you may rise up a standard in our lives. Help us, O oh God, to gain control over our politics situation, political situation. Help us, O oh God, to take control over the physical situation. Our roads, the way you manage our system in the government offices. Lord, help us, my Father, to take control over the spiritual arena in the body of Christ. Lord, we pray that the rulership of these areas is going to be based on heavenly matters and not on the earthly decisions. Take over, my Father. Take over, take over, take over 
in the land of Kenya. Lord, we thank you. We bless your holy name. In the book of Ephesians 3.10, the Bible says, to the intent of now, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. Let's pray that our prayers will pass through the dark politics. Our prayers is going to pass through the corrupt, corrupt, corruption deals that could be putting taxes to be so high. Let's pray that our prayers will have an effect in the land. Shall we just go before the Lord and respond to that? Father, we call on your name. Yes, Father, your manifest wisdom surpasses human understanding. And I pray that, Lord, you may take over. Take over, Lord. Take over, my Father. In the heavenly places, may you rule the affairs of man. Something spectacular to happen in the body of Christ. We call on your name. This morning, my Father, as a church, we deliberately ask you to make known your manifest wisdom that rules the land, the principalities, the policies that rules the land. May your manifest wisdom override whatever human decisions have made for a change, King of glory, for an act of change. Father, help us. Help us to love you. Help us to stand in the gate. Help us to walk with you. Father, we are so grateful that you have given us authority in the name of Jesus to wrestle over these powers. The name Jesus, Lord, is mighty through the pulling down of these strongholds. And so, Lord, we call, we come to you, we bind the strong man that is holding decisions in this, in this nation, that is giving wrong advice. We, we bring them down. We pull their thoughts down to submit to your will, to submit to your wisdom, to submit to your authority. Lord, we call on your name. We give you praise and we give you honor. Lord, we are asking that, Lord, you will give us weapons that will stand against the works of the enemy. We bless you and we worship you. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Come on, let's give the Lord amazing clap.